Good morning. <clears throat> so um, I'm going to talk about pretreatment and bioprocessing of biomass for fuels and chemicals. Uh, first, I'm going to talk about the conventional pretreatment process, and then co later I'll compare that with how we'll process uh, cabbie feedstocks. So cellulose is the most abundant polymer available on our planet. It's present in all these bioenergy sources, and uh, it is made up of uh, uh, glucose. Glucose is what yeast consumes, as Young Su just talked about, and produces all these different fuels and chemicals. How much of it is available? Well, the recent estimates from USDA DOE is that we have about 1.3 billion tons of this biomass available. And if we convert all this into, into biofuels, we can increase the amount of um, ethanol production in the United States by three to four folds. And because of its high potential, US Congress in 2007 passed uh, the Energy Independence and Security Act, which mandated production of 36 billion gallons of biofuels by 2022. 15 billion is expected to come from corn, uh, 16 billion from cellulosic ethanol, and 5 billion from other advanced biofuels. Now, if you look at the structure of the biomass, we see that the cell wall is made up of a very complicated structure of cellulose, hemicellulose, and lignin. Cellulose bundles are made up of these braided fibers. Um, that are perfectly aligned at a molecular level and give this very crystalline structure. These bundles are also called microfibrils. Surrounding the microfibrils is another polymer called hemicellulose that is cross-linked with cellulose. And hemicellulose is a C5 polymer. So cellulose is made up of C6 sugars. Hemicellulose is made up of C5 sugars, which is mostly xylose, arabinose, and galactose, along with C6 sugars. And then lignin is highly branched um, um, uh, raisin structure, uh, polyphenolic structure that goes into the spaces between the cellulose and the hemicellulose and provides the mechanical strength to the cell wall and by extension to the plant. So here you can see there's a model here where you can see the, the cellulose is those, uh, the blue bars. Surrounding that is the green and the yellow bars of the hemicellulose and brown is the glue, the lignin, that kind of holds all this uh, structure together and gives its recalcitrance. So when we do pretreatment, what we want to do is take apart that recalcitrant structure, open up, and release the, the polymers of uh, C5, C6 sugars so that the enzymes can access them and convert them into monomeric sugars. Now, there are all kinds of different pretreatment technologies that are available. Uh, you have physical, chemical, uh, biological, combination of these. But the most common ones that are used is hot water, dilute acid, dilute alkali. And lately, uh, physical methods like mechanical refining and things like that are gaining interest. So here you can see scanning electron micrographs of untreated biomass and three different pretreated biomass. And you can see the changes in the morphological changes in the, in the structure for the dilute acid, you can see the fibril structure has separated, opened up, and there's some breakage. The changes are not so drastic for the hot water and the dilute alkali, but you can see the lignin gets uh, redistributed as droplets. Now, when we talk about pretreatment, there are three major things that we have to focus on. Number one is we have to reduce the capital and the operating costs. So here is the capital and operating cost for three common pretreatment technologies. In the middle, you can see the cost of uh, the capital cost for hot water pretreatment is lower, but at the same time, the ethanol yield is also lower for hot water pretreatment. So you have to combine hot water pretreatment with some kind of other pretreatment technologies in order to increase the sugar yields. The second thing is you want to have very good sugar recoveries after the pretreatment process. And you do get that when you, when you put it through these three common pretreatment technologies. And then the last thing is that you want to minimize the production of these inhibitors. Here you can see in the picture 10% uh, sugars and the sugars that we get after hydrolysis. So you want to avoid the production of acetic acids, you know, furfurols, hydroxymethylfurfurols, um, and, and other, other aromatic compounds. Okay. So in concept, it's pretty straightforward about this whole cellulosic biorefinery. 
You start with the biomass, you put it through a pretreatment process, you release these sugars, and then you get um, some kind of uh, recombinant microorganism uh, that will utilize both C5, C6 sugars and produce you, you uh, ethanol or some kind of biofuel. But in reality, that is quite different, okay? There are many challenges associated with this process. The first one is, it's just the storage of the biomass. Here is the storage of one day of corn in a dry ground ethanol facility. Here is one day of cellulosic ethanol facility, the feedstock that you have to provide in cellulosic ethanol facility. There are about 1,000 1, bales uh, that need to go in. That's just one day. And just to give you an idea how big that is, there's a semi-truck right there, okay? And you have to store this stuff outside and exposed to the elements of the nature. If there's a lightning strike, the whole thing goes up in flames, which happened in one of the cellulosic biorefinery here in the United States. So, so storage is a big deal. Then you have to bring in huge processing equipment to bring this biomass in the refinery, pre-treat it, or I mean, sorry, reduce the particle size, get it ready for the hydrolysis and the processing part. Huge mechanical systems are needed to handle the solid liquid separation process. Um, and then the substrate is very, very viscous, and there's variability in this. Not only that, in addition to the feedstock coming in, you're bringing a lot of sand and stones. And these sand and stones will eat into your processing equipment. This is actual from a facility here in the United States, three inch stones coming in with the feedstock, which constantly shut down the processing equipment. And as a result, you're, you're constantly shutting down and cannot run the facility uh, continuously. There are four different enzymes that are required to break that crystalline cellulose structure into glucose. There are eight different enzymes that are required to break the hemicellulose into the monomeric sugars. And the total enzyme requirement is so much that you have to build the facility on site, right next to the cellulosic ethanol plant, in order to provide the enzymes to run that cellulosic biorefinery. So you can see that this, there are so many challenges associated with it, and as a result, U.S. Congress actually adjusted the numbers back in 2013 that, no, you don't have to produce whatever five to seven billion gallons of cellulosic ethanol, you only have to produce much less. But then again in 2018, they adjusted that number and said, only produce 288 million gallons of cellulosic ethanol. Guess how much was produced? Less than 10 million gallons, cellulosic ethanol. And that did not come from cellulosic refineries, that came from dry grind ethanol facilities converting corn fiber into, into cellulosic ethanol. So, big challenges. Here are all the refineries that have been built to convert cellulosic biomass into biofuels. There are seven of them, and of these seven, five have either been sold, repurposed, or idled. Now, there's only one cellulosic ethanol plant left running in the United States. And the other one is a very small plant in, in Brazil. So you can see there are a lot of challenges. This is where CABI comes in and introduces a brand new paradigm on production of biofuels. And in CABI, the solution is, let's modulate how these plants store this carbon and partition this carbon into a form that can be directly extracted from the plant and used for fuels or chemicals. So there's better understanding of the regulatory networks that control the sourcing control and the forms of carbon deposition that we can now divert that carbon from lignocellulosic in stems to oils in stems. And this is how we do it, is that sugar is produced uh, by photosynthesis in the green leaves, some of it goes for the structural carbohydrate, but then rest is stored as starch. But if you knock that gene out, you can convert that starch into free fatty acids. If you upregulate that gene, it goes into free fatty acids. Then if you knock out these two genes and upregulate that one, it starts to put it into triacylglycerols. And if you put in oleosin, it puts a protein body around it, and then it stores the oil. This is exactly what happens in soybeans. And this program exists in all plants. It just needs to be turned on. And that's what CABI is doing. So processing of CABI feedstocks becomes very easy. How do we do that? 
All you have is stems. You squeeze those stems out, you get the juice. And then you put a centrifuge on that to separate the oil and the, and the sugars based on the density difference. And you have your oil, you have your sugars, and then you convert that into, into biodiesel and, and ethanol or, or other, other fermentation products. Now, this is something that is already going on in the United States, this technology or the engineering part of it, the separation part of it. There are 200 plants in the United States that are recovering oil at the back end. And all they do is they put this strike enter centrifuge that gives you a semi-solid product and two different liquid products based on their density difference. And that's the oil that comes out. So we are not using anything different. This is technology that is proven, already being used. You apply it with cabbie feedstocks, and you get your oil and sugars. So it's very easy to process cabbie feedstocks. I think that's all I have. Thank you. <laughs>